three, two, one. In 1999, while Indian enterprise technology companies like Tata Consulting, Wipro, and Emphasis were growing in the U.S. with outsourcing to Indian developers, our guest today built an eight-figure business outsourcing to African and African diaspora developers. Her name is Rebecca Anuncho, and she is the founder of AppStack based in Bethesda, Maryland. We began our conversation discussing how building an elite brand for technology consulting required her to remove all limitations she's had in her mind about entrepreneurship and how being a Black woman selling African talent for multi-million dollar contracts required her to become a true unicorn. We then discuss her efforts to build the African tech ecosystem from the ground up, from building tech hubs to launching Catalyst Fund, the angel investor matching fund with African Business Angels Network and AfriLabs. If you've ever dreamed about creating a business that leverages African developers or angel investing across the African continent, then this episode will give you lots of useful information. After the show, check out our show notes at VentureTheWorld.com for more information about Rebecca and our other guests. Our hosts for today's episodes are Erican Oboto Taputo, Mark Fleming, and myself, Chinadua Nekwe. Welcome to Venture the World. Our listeners are in for a real treat with today's guest, Super Angel Rebecca Anonjong, founder and CEO of Apps Tech, based in Bethesda, Maryland, co-working space, co-founder of IO Spaces in Maryland and Active Spaces in her native Cameroon, chairwoman of Afri Labs and co-founder of African Business Angels Network. Basically, she's plugged into everything early stage technology in Africa. We'd like to thank Leslie Tita, Rebecca's IO Spaces co-founder, for submitting a question for today's interview. Welcome. <laughs> Glad to Thank have you. you. Thank you so much. And I think just to start off, because some people would know you, some of our listeners will know you well, some not so much. So just want to start with a basic background question. You built AppStack into a multinational enterprise technology company with yes. tens of millions in revenue. Also yes. recognized by not only the World Economic Forum, but also Larry Page and Sergey Brin. Not this year, but back in the early 2000s. <laughs> so you're yeah, sort of I'm old. Original, <laughs> I would say original entrepreneurs that we all stand on your shoulders. <laughs> so I would say a lot of people don't know this piece. So sort of explain how you've gone from the early days of transitioning into entrepreneurship in the early 2000s to your current early stage uh, chairwoman status. Yeah, so it's very interesting because I think a lot of people that know me in the ecosystem know me through my work in the ecosystem and not necessarily my business. I get a lot of, oh, I'm a blogger or, I mean, I spend my life on Twitter. This is true. So I, I, I see people see me through that prism and forget that I'm first and foremost um, a tech entrepreneur. So I started my company, as you said, actually in 1999. I started in, in Bethesda, Maryland, as you said, and we grew, opened offices in, on all three continents, had customers in 27 countries within uh, two and a half years, and we have customers in um, over 50 different countries. And so it's, it's had its challenges, especially my move into into Africa. When I opened a subsidiary in Cameroon, um, thinking I was smart and I wasn't, but, um, but, but yeah, but it, it, it's, it's amazing because I, I think that I, I never imagined that I would still be there 21 years later. I, I think that I, I didn't really understand what I was doing, which is great. Because when you don't know what you're doing, you don't put limits to yourself. I think that when you overthink entrepreneurship, you start putting limits because it looks so overwhelming and it's, it just looks like you can't get to the next step. And I, I, and I think my naivete and my not understanding what I was really getting into, both of those things really helped me 
when I started this company. I started with the tech boom, and then right after that was a tech crash. But at that time, there was nobody that looked like me. I mean, there was nobody that was a Black African woman doing enterprise software. It just it was such a misnomer. Um, it was just, I, I, that was what the real definition of a unicorn. And I really didn't think about it all that much, but I built my business in a way to protect me from what I would say is a deficit and that those biases that people have against um, women, first of all, and then black women and then Africans in general, um, thinking that you're trying to sell us millions of dollars in in services or in technology, you can't possibly have the skills um, to deliver. And so I, I, I hid in the brand and I really worked really hard on building AppStack as a brand and separating that brand from my persona. And, and I think that that's really how I was able to get through, especially the first the first few years. That's really interesting. We interviewed Viola Llewellyn on Venture the World, and she mentioned a similar story that she didn't know the challenges that she would be facing ahead of her as a woman in tech raising capital. And so she just went out there and did it, kind of wrote the story. And I've heard a similar story from Tonya Cole, the founder of uh, Sahara uh, Group uh, of companies. And he said when he initially started, he built out the brand on his, on his business cards, he would just put associate when he and his partners were the, the owners. And so it's really interesting to hear. Your, uh, so your I, d- I didn't, ha- I didn't have any title on my business card at all. Mm-hmm. So I, I had no title. I just had my name, my mail address, contact information. Back then we still put physical addresses on our, and so I would go around and I could be a sales one time. I could be a, an engineer another time. I can put it in a negative term, but they're not exactly the most social butterfly people on the outside, right? So we are all as geeks already on the outside. And when you add to that, the other physical characteristics, it it really makes it challenging. Now, I have to say that I always said that technology is a great equalizer because when you're downloading an app from the Google um, Play Store, You don't know if it's a woman or a man or a black person or an African, or you have no clue. It's really the technology that speaks for itself. And that's what I tried to put forward in building Upstack is putting the technology forward, making sure that it was simple to buy. And there was a little human interaction in the buying process. So that because most of my team, most of my staff was African like me. And so we productize services at a time when nobody was doing that. And so we had packages that companies could purchase where we didn't have to send resumes because some of our African sounding names, they're like, hmm, it starts raising a whole bunch of other questions. And we avoided all of that and said, hey, we're guaranteeing you a result. And this is in 2000. Nobody was doing that. Nobody was saying, okay, we're providing services to you, but we're doing it in such a way that if it doesn't work, you don't pay us, right? Um, Mm -hmm. And so that de-risked the purchasing process and we signed subscriptions. And again, this is way before SaaS. This is way before subscription models were popular, but so people signed long-term contracts with a service level agreement, uh, basically a guarantee that their systems would be up and running, or if it was a product that we were delivering, that it would work and within a certain time period. And so it, it was really de-risking it for the customer, allowing us to sign a lot more customers and allow us to scale our services, which again was a difficult thing to do. It still is a difficult thing to do, but at the time it was a very, very new business model. So you really took an early stab at betting on African talent by putting your company, basically, uh, its revenue in the hands of the talent that you saw in Africa. So 
the entrepreneur yeah, it, it wasn't necessarily in africa so no. a, a lot of the um, team was in the diaspora so okay. in the us in the uk and in france and in canada is where we had our offices and where we recruited all africans and so it, it, all africans running those entities and then in the us and our main we had i would say probably about 65, 70% African staff. So definitely we had to work really hard to brand the company as elite. Like we looked at McKinsey was our model in the branding because everybody wanted to hire McKinsey, but their first thought would be, can we afford them, right? It wasn't whether or not they're good. Nobody would question whether or not they were good at what they did. It was just, maybe they're too expensive. And that's how we tried to brand ourselves so that nobody would ever question our capabilities. And it would really be focused on, can we afford them? And we, we never wanted to, because this was also when the, the Indian firms were just all over the place and growing like mad but with really, really, really low pricing. And we did not want to compete. We didn't want to compete with Indian labor. It was just not possible. We just couldn't make money um, that way. You've been also investing as, a, as an angel and you've seen the ecosystem in Africa grow and develop over these past 20 years that you've been in entrepreneurship. What do you think are some of the biggest or greatest changes? And also, what are the some changes that have affected your business in terms of enterprise technology? So we started an organization, some other members of the diaspora in 2000. We started an organization called Africa Technology Forum to support technology entrepreneurship in Africa. And we had one of the projects that we had uh, at the time was something called the African Center for Technology, Innovation and Ventures. And what that was meant to be was a, a tech hub, a place where we could take talent, um, promote this talent, support the talent and help them go from an idea to a full business and then fund them. Right. That was the idea. And uh, the acronym for the African Center of Technology, Innovation and Ventures is ACTIVE. That ended up uh, becoming ACTIVE Spaces, which is the first independent hub in Cameroon that we launched 10 years later. And as an independent entity, not as an Africa Technology Forum entity, but it just to say that it, it took that long to, to harness all of this energy that so many people had to start really building concrete projects that would really work to support entrepreneurship on the continent. And so when Active Spaces started, and Africa Spaces also co-founded Afrolabs, there were five hubs in Afrolabs. There were five hubs. And, you know, probably 10 on the continent today, Afrolabs has over 200 members. We have 202 members in 46 different countries supporting a community of over a million African entrepreneurs. And so for me, it's almost a reflection of, it's almost our dream come true but it's come true so much bigger and so much better than I ever could imagine. The impact of technology on the continent, you know, when we look at how mobile transformed, completely transformed the continent, when we're looking at, 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 at the impact of mobile money today, and the fact that we Africans are leaders in mobile tech in the world. I mean, this is unbelievable for me. I'm still, just amazed at um, how things have progressed. Do we have a lot of work to do? Absolutely. You know, if in this very difficult period of, of coronavirus, if there's one ray of hope, it's that businesses 
that have been very, very slow to get online are being forced to use technology and have been pushed into finding technology that they can use and work with remotely, which is something that we've been pushing for, for years and years and years. And so, yes, Africa, we still have such a journey to go on, but I'm still pleased to see the impact that technology has already had. And my hope and my dream is that we just continue. One of the battles that I've had, um, especially over the last couple of years, has been African technology in Africa. We see a lot of the startups that are getting funding, for instance, are in Africa, but not necessarily African. And, and so that's part of, of my battle today is saying, okay, we've seen the promise of, of tech startups in, uh, in Africa. We've seen the, the promise of innovation and its transformative power. We need that in the hands of Africans. And so that is really where I am right now, still excited about what has transpired so far. Amazing. And thank you so much for sharing that. I, I have so much um, respect for all of the things you've mentioned. And if folks just haven't given you your flowers, I want to make sure you're always getting your flowers. So we just thank you so much, Rebecca. Another oh, question. Thank you. Around, yeah, for sure. Just incredibly inspiring. Like every time I hear your story, I'm just like, yes, yes, Rebecca. Okay. <laughs> So to that point, you've dealt with um, some high profile customer disputes and have a high profile on Twitter, which you haven't been afraid to use to comment on very sensitive political issues. How have you wielded such a strong voice and what advice would you have for other entrepreneurs in terms of their profile and leveraging their voices to stand for important issues? So when I started on Twitter and I started late, I'm a late adopter of technology, which is really strange, right? I got on Facebook way later than everybody. I got on Twitter 10 years ago. And so I wasn't one of the first users uh, of Twitter. And when I got on Twitter, I was anonymous. So I was Africa techie. I wasn't Rebecca Nonshong. I was, there was no picture. I, I used the map of uh, the African continent. And I, I did that because I was afraid. I'd already moved back to Cameroon and I, I had a blog that I was anonymous still at the time called Diary of an African Entrepreneur, where I never put my name and I never put my country, but I felt like it was a way for me to release. It was so cathartic. The stress and the unbelievable situations that I would find myself in I, I found that blogging um, these experiences was really a, a, a lifesaver for me. And then when I discovered Twitter, I found that it was a smaller, like smaller text or shorter text, but it gave me that same feeling of being able to release and being able to speak out on, on issues that were affecting me personally, but also affecting others. Particularly, as I'd say in the, the first years, I was, uh, I was especially on corruption. So I followed a lot of anti-corruption websites and political freedom, democracy were all issues that I was really, really tweeting about and slowly came out of my shell. It took me, I say, three years to put my name on Twitter. I was actually outed by a great friend of mine, Mariam Jam, who, who put me on a, on a list of people you should follow on Twitter. And so she reached out and she wanted my name. And I was like, should I give it to her? <laughs> and I gave it to her. That's how I was outed on Twitter. But I think that, that a lot of it is the confidence because now I have enough followers that it's difficult to censor me. I do censor myself, even though you would never imagine this when you follow my Twitter feed. You would never think I censor myself, but I do censor myself. Um, there are certain uh, things that I don't put out there because I am in, a, in an environment that's not 100% open. 
and my family and, and so on and so forth. But I think that what I've been consistent about on that Twitter feed is being very authentic and just saying it as I feel it and no pretense. This is, hey, I'm just, this is what I think. This is how I feel. And I, I think that authenticity appeals to, uh, and I don't have any agenda, right? My only agenda on Twitter is getting more people interested in Africa tech. That was the only thing, but I, I'm not trying to drive any sales or a political agenda yeah. or, and, and so it, it, I think it helps because um, I can remain authentic and very independent um, yeah. voice on Twitter. Yeah. I want to add something in because having that authentic voice on Twitter and being able to say whatever you want, it will endear you to lots of people in different countries. And now as you're moving on and you're a co-manager of an angel fund, and you're also known as one of Africa's premier super angels, I would call you. And having this sort of wide breadth to talk to uh, diverse cultures and groups of people, how do you assess the risk of investing at the early stages with so many different cultures in so many different markets? This is what a lot of people are trying to do. What's the risk? And are there any sort of shortcuts that you learn that other investors could use? Sure. I think that one of the things that we do at ABAN, the African Business Angels Network, is to provide education programs for early stage investors because we spent a lot of years training entrepreneurs, a whole lot of programs on supporting entrepreneurs in how do you negotiate a term sheet, how do you calculate your valuation, and how do you make yourself basically investment ready? All of these things, we've always focused on the entrepreneur the, with the assumption the, the investor knows what they're doing. Because angel investment as an asset class is so new in Africa, there are a lot of, of high net worth individuals that want to invest or are investing and didn't really realize that it had this tag of angel investing. So as an organization, ABAN is really trying to support and strengthen the early stage investment ecosystem by supporting investors. One of the projects that we're launching, this is already funded in large part, one of those is called Catalyst, and it's in collaboration with Afrolabs. And so Catalyst is a matching program. So an angel investor would put in money into a startup that's a member of the Afrolabs network. And the Catalyst Fund would then match that angel investment. This is really to encourage a lot more angel investment on the continent. Imagine that I'm an angel investor in Cameroon. I have a, a total of $10,000 available to put into startups. Now that money can be stretched, right? Because that $10,000 becomes $20,000 to the startup. And so it has a lot more impact. This is a Pan-African program because it, it's for startups in any Afrolabs hub. And as I said, they're in 46 different countries. There are 202 hubs. This is a million plus entrepreneurs that will eventually be able to benefit from this program uh, that we're putting together. So this is one way to encourage angel investment. How do I assess an investment? I look at the entrepreneur, A, their integrity, because the startup will pivot. It will change. It will become something completely different from what you expected. I'm actually working on a startup myself. I'm a co-founder in a new startup that's in AppStack, so I'm, I feel this. I mean, what, when we started this project two years ago, it, it didn't look anything like what it, it's looking like as we're going live within the next couple of weeks. So that's the nature of startups. And so the founders and those that are navigating those changes and are able to execute and can master that flexibility, that's super important. But I think that the most important element and the, the thing that 
all investors will look at. First is the integrity of the founders. COVID-19 is one of the biggest challenges that I think every entrepreneur is facing. Is there anything in your toolbox that entrepreneurs or investors can apply to be equipped to handle COVID-19 or to get them through this particular situation? The one thing that I, I think I said it online some a, a couple of weeks ago in a tweet chat is treat it like a hurricane. You run for cover, <laughs> protect yourself, defend yourself, because I, I see very, very smart entrepreneurs think that they're going to outsmart COVID. 19, right? And they are putting together programs because they want to leverage it. it it's one of those um, situations. It's, it's such a crisis that the best thing you can do is stretch your dollars for as long as you can so that you can support your customers for as long as you can. You can support your team and keep your team together for as long as you can, because what you're doing is really facing a hurricane and you're not facing that hurricane alone. Your customers are facing it too. So even though you might assume and believe that you have the wherewithal to survive this or even to thrive in it, your customers that are paying you may not be able to. So you almost really need to look at not only how this crisis affects you as a business, but look at your revenue model and look at where your revenue is coming from and look at how COVID-19 is impacting your sources of revenue. Because when we went through the 2002, 2001, early 2000s dot-com crash, well, some of our customers had 5,000 employees, 10,000 employees. They disappeared. Wow. They're gone. Yeah. As an entrepreneur, you're navigating challenges anyway, but how can you do that uh, since this is like a special case for COVID-19? <laughs> yeah, I think that, as I said, really hunker down and be ready to go through this for a very long time. I think the economic impact is going to be devastating for so many so many companies um, and individuals. And so whether you're in a consumer-based um, business or in an enterprise B2B style business, you will be impacted. Even governments are going to have sm smaller budgets to devote to anything, even needed technology. So really brace for impact and try to hang on to what you have um, for as long as possible. You know, I've been through this and it's hard. And I think the hardest thing is as an entrepreneur is dealing with the psychology because this is something you have absolutely no control over. And as entrepreneurs, we love control, right? We love to do spreadsheets and look at do projections and see and look. This is one of those situations where our world is going to look so different than it looks today. And I don't know what it's going to look like. I can't tell you and I can't predict what the biggest and best technology will be that comes out of this. Sure, we'll get innovation out of this. And some existing businesses are really well positioned to navigate this. Anybody that had already started doing things online, like online medical, where you can get a medical consultation online and, and get a prescription and things like that online, all of those types of businesses that in Africa anyway, that weren't as attractive, all of a sudden there's, are, are almost mandatory. And so if you've already started a, a startup and you already have that technology, yeah, you'll be able to get a lot more users. The issue is people won't have a lot of money and getting people to choose between putting data credit and phone credit on their phone and paying for your technology, that's where you really need to start looking at how you can best do that.
But overall, my best thing is save as much money. Don't spend money. Um, <laughs> save as much <laughs> as you can to engage for the, the long run. Now, as investors, some investors are actually that have already raised their funds. And this is harder for angel investors, right? I'll give you a, as myself as an example. I was just getting ready to hit send on a safe for a startup that I wanted to invest in. And then it was like the COVID news. And I'm like, oh, let me just not hit the send button right now. Let me just <laughs> start looking. And I, I didn't send this. I didn't do it. And it's a great startup. And I really, really want to be an investor in that startup because I know they're going to make it. But I'm just like ha cash hoarding right now because I still have payroll, right? Mm -hmm. So this extra money that angel investors have for startups now becomes essential, right? Because you're like, you don't know how your revenue is going to be. You don't know. And so you, you really just want to hoard cash as much as possible so that you can get through this. But those investors that have already raised their funds, right? So they already have the money in their funds. A lot of them, the ones that I've spoken to, are actually seeing this as an opportunity because they have money that they can invest, right? They, they don't need to hoard the cash. They're going to be cautious for sure, but they're also seeing that maybe valuations will be lower and they can afford um, to do some, some of the investments that they couldn't afford to before because the valuations were so high. Um, they're also looking at some of the, the startups that are in like e-health that already exist, um, ed tech, that kind of thing, where they had looked at it, but the growth numbers in, since COVID in EdTech are unbelievable. I sat on the board of an EdTech in Kenya and my goodness, the user adoption is like, it's just, it, it, it's the bad analogy, but if you look at the COVID um, curve and how fast it's going up as far as cases, that's what their uh, user numbers are, are lo looking like. So that presents an interesting question. And this is the question from Leslie Tita that we would like to bring in. He's your co-founder. And yeah. this also dovetails into a question that are, are really a statement that some investors have sort of uh, said that they're looking for in Africa to emerge the, the next Alibaba or the next Tencent. And given the numbers that you're seeing and given Africa's sort of history of leading the way in some categories like mobile money, do you see some African tech companies expanding into the US market over the next decade? Sort of like Zipline is coming out of Ghana and Rwanda into America. Do you see some other opportunities like that? I think that, that we have a trust issue is that Africans themselves don't trust African technology. Mm -hmm. And so it's really going to need a mind shift. And perhaps this will provide that mind shift. Do I see another Alibaba? Probably not because Alibaba is primarily one country, which is China. We have 54 countries. And so we have a lot of very different environments. And we also have different competition because Alibaba is looking at Africa more than Africa is looking at Africa. So we do need a mind shift. I, I was just on a webinar today with a UN, I would say an African organization, I should say. And we were talking about technology solutions for COVID. And the first hour and a half, we were talking about Chinese tech. Um, and all these Chinese tech, these, and I'm not saying they're bad tech. I'm just saying that they had an hour and a half of presenting what they were doing. The Africa techs had like three minutes to, to present what they were doing. And I think it's just a reflection of a reality that we have on the ground is that we, we do not trust ourselves when it comes to technology. And we assume that we have to import the technology. We assume that in order to grow, we have to have an Alibaba, right? Whereas perhaps one of the companies that might emerge 
may not be an e-commerce at all. You know, maybe something completely different, something brand new that nobody's ever thought of before. But I think that rather than trying to focus on the unicorns, on trying to be an Alibaba, what I'd love to see is scale in terms of the numbers of successful startups. Rather than seeing, you know, five hugely successful startups, I'd like to see 50,000 very successful um, startups, maybe generating 100 million, 50 million, or 100 million in revenue, maybe not billions and billions of dollars, but seeing massive scale. Because out of that massive scale of really great, successful startups will emerge the next founders that will create the Facebooks and the Alibabas and so on and so forth. But I think that where we are in our ecosystem, we need to transition from being micro startups and at least be successful high growth startups before we can hope for an, an Alibaba. So thank you. I'm here with Erican and Mark, and we're deeply appreciative of you spending your time and taking it out to uh, entertain our audience at Venture the World. We really appreciate all that you've done for the African ecosystem, and we look forward to having you back on as you continue to launch your startup within Apps Tech, as you continue to make some funding announcements through the Catalyst Fund at African Business Angels Network, and if you want to make some personal uh, investment announcements on uh, Venture the World in the future, we welcome you back. So thank you for joining us. And uh, Thank you so much for having me. I, I'm honored. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. To find more episodes, visit VentureTheWorld.com. You can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at VTW underscore HQ. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review, which will help other listeners like you venture the world. Thanks. Thanks.